Welcome to the 81st Annual Cold Spring Harbour Laboratory Symposium on Quantitative Biology. This year's topic is on targeting cancer. I am Gemma uh, Alderson from Nature Reviews Cancer and I'm here with um, Gabrielle Burgers from CSF, who's soon to be moving to Belgium to VIB. And thank you for joining us. Um, you haven't given your talk yet, so it's hard for me to ask you about all of the things that I haven't heard you speak about. But um, uh, I wondered if you could kind of, obviously you, uh, you're known to be working on the tumour microenvironment and uh, angiogenesis in particular. And I wonder if you could give us uh, some background into where we're at with that. that with at the moment. Yeah. So I think it's an, an interesting time right now because we are realising that the old idea of blocking blood vessels and getting rid of them, um, depleting the tumour of it, is, is not going to starve the tumour to, to death, as Dr. George Wolfman had proposed. And that it actually makes it much worse sometimes, you know, due right. to the hypoxic conditions and recurrence. And so then the whole idea flipped and the idea came now up to make blood vessels more functional. Mm -hmm. And so this was then Rakus Jane coming in with the idea of vessel normalization. But the problem was it's a very transient process and you have good efficacy for a while, but then the whole situation recurs again. You have regrowth and you get recurrence. So what to do now? Right. And this was a, a big hurdle. Then in addition to that, all the anti-antigenic therapies, specifically in form of VGF receptor signaling pathways, again, they were very transient. In many tumors, they were not working. And nobody really understood in the beginning why it is that mm -hmm. if you just block blood vessels, that it works in one tumor, but it doesn't work in the other. Right. And this is when a couple of years ago, you know, several laboratories, including ours, started to, deal, to identify some of the resistance mechanisms. Mm -hmm. and these are very distinctly different because it's not just classic resistance, where the cells don't respond to the inhibitor, but they find evasive programs and then they just don't care about the inhibitor anymore and right. grow happily. <laughs> yeah. So here was a concept, so can we do combination therapy and can we make it then better? And by learning more and more about this, we then stumbled into two different directions. One was the implication of myeloid cells in resistance and causing a pro angiogenic relapse. And the other part was uh, actually that the tumors do not necessarily have to reactivate the angiogenic program, but they find alternatives. For example, they become more invasive simply crawl along blood vessels and then grow. Right. And that I was very interested in because in glioblastomas, that seemed to be a very interesting pathway. And so the glioblastomas are not invasive and they indeed already favor this pathway, but they enhance it. Right. But again, only a subset of tumors. So why is it that yeah. GBMA does it and GBMB yeah. doesn't do it? So that's when we started looking into further mechanism. And by doing that, we then realized when we looked at these vascular niches in tumors that there is not just a niche, a niche, a niche. It's just really a very, very heterogeneous program of niches. Right. And so you have a dynamic program where you have antigenic niches and you can have, have hypoxic niches, you can have invasive tumor niches, you can have metastatic niches, where again tumor cells come in and, um, and just cuddle around the blood vessels and co-op them. And so here the idea was what's happening then if you do therapeutics to all these distinct vascular niches. And that was very exciting. Right. Because we realized that the niches would respond very differently to it. And it was dependent on the composition of the cells mm -hmm. with the different tumor cells, but also dependent on the genetic and epigenetic program of the tumor cells. Right. So you have the diversity, the heterogeneity from the tumor cells and the heterogeneity of the microenvironment yeah. then dynamically interact. So if you come now in with specific inhibitors or chemotherapy, then you will kind of select again pathways or programs that will either help the tumor or eventually hopefully get rid of it. Mm -hmm. And so we have looked into all these different pathways. Right. And this is one of the major aspects that you're fully pursuing right now. Yeah. Now with regard to targeting the vascular niche, of course, we all know anti-VGF therapy is not going to make it. So we need to have some other concepts, but what is it that we really want to do? Mm -hmm. And by studying immune modulation and antiangenic therapy, we actually realized not only can we make blood vessels more functional in a way that there is better oxygen delivery and therefore you have better chemotherapeutic effects, but you can actually turn them into specialized blood vessels 
that now help to get T cells into the tumor. Right. And these are high endothelial manuals. Mm -hmm. So we found for the first time that we can therapeutically induce AGV formation in some of these tumors. And when you do it, then you have a very good prognosis with the tumor. Right. Is that because of clearance from the T cells or...? It's because of that that the T cells actually come in, right. you know, and yeah. become activated. So you yeah. have you have to have different programs, and I think mm. there has been the immunology field and there has been the angiogenesis field, and now we are coming closely together. And I have right. to grab my own nose that we were all thinking about blood vessels and VGF and making new, you know, new little vessels and capillaries, but we were not thinking about what VGF actually does to the immune system. Right. Yeah. And so it's a very immune suppressive factor, and the tumor vessels themselves are highly immune suppressive. So there is PDL1 upregulation, for example, a negative checkpoint regulator. So on if you have on the EDT, yeah. so if right. you have high PDL1 already on the tumor vessels, yeah. and then lower adhesion molecules, your T cells can't come in. Mm. So that's the first barrier. So these blood vessels again become a gate go in or not right. and so instead of getting rid of them where you actually make it worse the t-cells could really not get in so now we need to turn them into something that we can get them in right but yeah. the important part is you want to have the right cells and then you have to have them yeah. activated yeah and so this is where the whole pro reprogramming comes in that when you are successful in doing it then they really become active and they can make a difference and so we looked in the literature and you know there are a variety of different clinical studies shown that when they look at spontaneous HIV formation in many human tumor types, breast cancer, melanomas, gastric cancer, colon cancer, it always correlates with good prognosis and survival. Mm. And so here the idea is now how can we therapeutically employ this and really target these blood vessels in a way that we can alter them and turn them into HIV and thereby mm much better attack the tumor. Right. And this comes back to the whole point that you know you have your immune system and you have the vasculature and they functionally are interregulated. If you think about the myelin cells even during wounding, they can become first activated, then they kill, attack, but then they need to switch in the resolution phase and they need to become immune suppressive and antigenic, so normal homeostasis program. Mm -hmm. where the tumor takes advantage of this right, yeah. and can flip them. Yeah. The, the good part is you can flip them too. Right. You need to be yeah. certain that you yeah. don't flip them Keep back them into the back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so here is kind of the idea, and I think this is a really evolving theme in many different laboratories that are mm. you know, highly involved in this, but I think it's a very exciting area mm. to see whether you can have it. And not only in primary tumors, you know, the question is, uh, can you also do this in metastatic disease? Right. Yeah, That's absolutely. of course the most important yeah. part. So would you still be able also to do HIV formation in metastasis? Mm -hmm. Can you actually eradicate that too right. if you use a protest like that. Yeah. So for me that's a very exciting part. Right. So that deals more with the angiogenic niche. But the other niche is also close to my heart because you know I'm in the neurosurgery department, glioblastoma patients, you know, they they do not survive for long. Well, it's just the I think the uh, the overall survival is about one and a half years. Right. And in all these years we only have three FDA approved drugs and they're not working well. Interesting part is the third one was bevacizumab, again an anti-VGF therapy. Yep. So people were very excited in the beginning, it was accelerated FDA approval and it turns out now it's not so great. Mm. But it turns out to be again that you need to individualize the therapy. So there was a recent Genentech um, trial really evaluating the different subtypes of GBM patients and it turns out that if you are a pro-neural wild-type GBM patient, you can actually have even overall survival benefit with right. bevacizumab. Okay. Whereas, you know, patients with normal mesenchymal and other tumors don't. Yeah. So individualization is again the key, but it's mm. certainly not sufficient. Right. Now in our case, stumbling onto the invasive niche does not necessarily have something to do with therapy per se, because mm. it's also a natural pathway. Right. And I mean, for decades, people have tried to identify factors that's being implicated. And you will see, I mean, arrays and laser capture, microscopy, and isolating cells. And always, you know, you find some factors here and some factors there, mm. but no golden bullet. Right. Go. Yeah. So we came in with this approach of targeting the microglial cells in this case, because what we noticed is that the tumor cells that invade are closely associated with these cells. And these are nothing else but resident brain uh, macrophages. Right, okay. And so they, they act very similar and have very similar function. Mm. 
And because of the close interaction, we looked at activation pathways and we thought that some are specifically activated in, in those microglial cells that are associated with the invading tumor cells. We got this interested in within the niche. So yes, yeah, absolutely. So they yeah. are moving along these blood vessels and around them, like in a sandwich, yeah. are these microglial cells. And I think this is again a normal wounding response. Right. So yeah. microglial cells come in. Mm. You know. So we did first some in vitro assays, you know, and then we went into in vivo, and and the results were stunning because for the first time we were absolutely able to make circumscribed tumors. Not only one tumor type, but we had different gliomas and even low-grade astrocytomas. Very different tumor types, genetic, different background. But every time we have the same thing. And this is exciting because you cannot resect gliomas in patients because of the invasive nature. In right. other organs, it doesn't matter if you cut a little bit more. In the brain, you can't. And so the recurrence is fast, specifically given that they are so resistant to any therapy. So the hope is how we need to change the trial design right. and first find ways to treat, make them circumscribed and then get surgical resection and hope with other combinations can we then really substantially extend the lifespan of a patient. Yeah. And so clearly if you do a single therapy, you don't have a survival benefit. Right. Yeah. Because all what you do is you change your growth pattern, but you don't change the speed. Right. Yeah. And that is congruent with some of the clinical data that have come out now with CSF1 receptor inhibitors yeah. and also with the P3 kinase inhibitors that we have been using. So our data are totally in, in compliance with these. Mm. But I'm not you know, discouraged by that because the idea is not can we combine it. And so I talked to neuro oncologists and the idea is with standard therapy, can you keep the tumor in check mm -hmm. long enough to make the tumor circumscribed. Right. The, the idea is really that the tumor cells will not just crawl back and form a little circle and hold hands, <laughs> but you know, it will expand to a level where you have a, a markation. Right, okay. And that's what we are trying. So we have, yeah. we have done it in combination with some of the chemotherapies mm -hmm. and at least in mouse models, it seems to work. Now you need to find and really assess that in clinical trials. And I'm very excited that this is something that's not being discussed at UCSF and then hopefully we'll get this going. Yeah. And if that really works, then that would be that would be really a big step yeah. in blocking invasion yeah. like that. But exactly. again, it's a microenvironment per se. Yeah. Because what these cells do is they activate various pathways of the tumor cells. It's just not one factor, it's just not one pathway. It's mm. peer 3 kinase, step three, and if copper B, you name it. Yeah. And probably dependent on the glioma type or whoever it will be, this one will be favored or the other one. Mm -hmm. You can have them all. Yeah. So we did RNA seq and we did cluster analysis. We know we are doing the right thing because the clusters all show genes involved in motility and invasion. Right. Yeah. But it's not like factor A that's 20 times, you know, <laughs> inhibited or yeah. factor V that must it is really a cluster of, of different genes mm -hmm. that are being involved in this pathway. Right. And so therefore, again, instead of trying now to see, well, can I take triple factor here and can I do this here and do combinations which are terribly toxic when we're not working, mm -hmm. find a way to block the parakine dialogue between these two cell types yeah. to, to block the path. Yeah. Yeah. So these are the two major uh, aspects that I'm very interested in. Yeah, but they all focus on the vascular mass. Yeah. Yeah, and improving therapy for, for patients in the future, right? So, yep. Yeah, it's exciting stuff. So, um, so in terms of the real challenges, I mean, uh, what are the real challenges in terms of your research? Is it kind of modeling or kind of where, where you're at with kind of, what are the hurdles you need to overcome to move forward? Finances. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it, it's always a problem when you start with mouse models right. and you need to go and show that it's really happening in mm. patients. I mean, yeah. I can bring an example that we would love to have, you know, uh, tissue samples from patients that have been treated with these inhibitors to see uh, our hypothesis that we're trying to prove in a mouse model is really true in patients. Mm. And you realize that you get sections that are really suboptimal, that are not at the invading border, that simply have not been treated for long enough. I mean, the translation to really do in trials from treatment trials is very challenging. Yeah. And so hopefully now when we combine it, we will have a better aspect of it. The other problem is of course also, if we look at invasive borders 
we cut out the brain and we look at it. Why you can't do this with the inpatient? So when you do no. the treatment, no. how do you know the treatment is working? Mm. How do you know that you know, the tumors become more circumscribed, for example? Right? Right. And so it's a resolution essay. So working together with MRI and spec specialists at UCSF. Uh, to, to see whether there are any means by which one can measure this non-invasively. Right. And, you know, Sarah Nelson, Sabrina Ronan are expert in, in, in this area. Mm -hmm. And so it is very, very nice. The, the other niche when we come to that, again, antigenic and immune modulatory therapy, the problem always has been biomarkers. Right. Do we know response in relapse? Mm -hmm. And so I got quite excited about it when we realized, looking at these myeloid cells when they change, so when they become actually immune stimulatory and angiostatic during therapy, mm -hmm. you can measure this even in blood monocytes. So you can take those and actually see that they're also changing right. because they're circulating back and forth. Right. Yeah. And the same holds true if you look at relapsing tumors. We now see more activated myeloid cells also in the blood. So here's the hope that, you know, you, if you find an ideal signature, you can actually take blood from patients and right. see is therapy working on it. So it's another aspect we're mm. working on. But that would be, that would be fantastic yeah. because that would be really a first possibility to look as yeah. a patient responding or not. Absolutely. And for how long. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Hugely challenging though, given this, this massively dynamic nature. Yeah, it's things. extremely dynamic, but yeah. that makes it interesting, I yeah, think. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Definitely. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Thank you. <laughs>